Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Midas Letter Raw. I'm here with my good friend, Polsky Gorky Ed Molesky. Ed, how are you doing today? A lot of skis in that introduction. A lot of skis. Well, you're Polsky Gorky Ed Ski. Well, Blil Ski. Today's show, we have two interviews of note, noteworthy, three rather interviews of note. Bruce Campbell joins us again. You must remember Bruce Campbell. He's the uh, head and uh, chief portfolio manager of Stonecastle Asset Management out in Vancouver. He's a regular guest on our show as well as on many others. And then uh, Dr. Alan Dabdoff joins us. He's the CEO of Zortex Therapeutics, as we have been babbling madly about here. And uh, he's going to tell us about why the stock is on fire, why it's of such interest. And it's a, it's this, it's a brand new story, essentially. Basically, because now it's, it's caught, got an audience. You and me. In the United States. Well, and we're telling everybody. And, well, you know what? And we are reaching our peeps. Our peeps are like, huh? What? Anyways, we also have Adam Wilkes joins us. He's the CEO of Tyson 2.0. Now, this is an interesting story because you will recall that Mike Tyson, the famous pugilist, uh, who is the... I was the, a big fan of, of Iron Mike. Were you a big fan? I liked Iron Mike. Yeah, he was a good... Guy, I, the last time I remember seeing him fight seriously, he bit off Evander Holyfield's ear. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He was malnourished. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so Mike Tyson is back for a second round of uh, cannabis. Uh, Tyson Ranch got wound down apparently, and now he's behind uh, Tyson 2.0, who has a big partnership with Columbia Care. Uh, so I'll let Adam tell you about that. That's coming up. Yes, we have all of this for you. If you're enjoying the show, subscribe to Midas Letter on YouTube so you stay up to date on everything investment. So, let's run through some audience questions now. Vassi wants to know, what is this marketing thing you do for Boxster? I don't get the point. Well, Vassi, uh, Boxster is a publicly traded company. There are over 30,000 publicly traded companies in the world vying for a limited pool of investor dollars. The more they have to do to attract investors, the more they spend on capital. The higher the cost of capital, the less upside there is for investors in those deals. So it is incumbent on publicly traded companies to engage marketing influencers with an audience like us so that they can efficiently attract an ever widening audience of investors to help them raise money and achieve their corporate objectives. Hope that helps. Carlos Levia wants to know, Midas, I love your psychedelic stock videos. Which stock is your favorite? If I had to pick one, uh, Carlos, you know, I don't like to be pigeonholed into picking just one stock because I actually don't own any psychedelic stocks right now. Uh, sold out of all the ones I had. My favorite one to date that I've had the most fun with has been um, uh, Compass Pathways, which was the first one. It's the biggest market cap one. Uh, there are a whole bunch of junior ones out there that we have had on the show. I don't have a favorite at this point. Um, my favorite one is always though the one that I own, and at this point I don't own one, so there you go. Cuddles wants to know, what makes next-gen psychedelic drugs better than first-gen drugs such as natural psilocybin aside from the patentability? Well, Cuddles, the corporatized biomedical uh, psychedelics trade wants to isolate the effect of psychedelics drugs without having their patients need to commit to eight hours of psychedelic experience. So they're isolating the molecules and trying to modulate titration, which is the rate at which the experience comes on, the dosage, if you will. And so for instance, they don't want to have to deal with a patient who's going to be flipping out for eight hours. Right, right. They want to be in and yeah. out of the office in one hour so they can you know, do the next thing. These are people driven by corporations. So yeah, there is no substitute for the natural experience in my personal opinion. Um, but I guess this is just Corporate how, America has a different view. Exactly. This is how psilocybin gets legal. I'm all for it. Whatever. 
The lock open. Hi, James. Have you heard of TAT Global Alternatives? Let us know what you think. Thanks. Well, as a matter of fact, we happen to know a little thing or two about Fake, TAT. Uh, uh, try to Alternative cigarettes. No tobacco? No tobacco. No nicotine. No nicotine. No nicotine. Trading at about three and change a share. It, it, you know what? They're selling product. They're uh, selling product. But we don't know much about the company itself. What we're going to do? Maybe we should get some of the product and smoke it on the show. I just quit smoking it. For but the it's not time. smoking. Well, it is. No. Just because it's not tobacco. Well, it's not you smoke. smoke weed. No. You smoke no, weed. No. No. <laughs> no. Can't hear you. Okay. okay. So yeah. So we don't know a lot about them, but uh, we'll try to get the CEO on. Tesla is already bigger than the next ten biggest auto stocks. How high can Tesla price run? That's an easy question to p answer. Depends how much money the Fed prints. As long as the Fed is printing money, Tesla and all of its technology stock peers in the United States have nowhere to go but up. Has nothing to do with their value or their balance sheet. Has everything to do with how much money does the Fed print. It's complete fantasy, and there is no limit to the fantasy that we can uh, experience at the hands of the Fed. Okay. Jackie357 wants to know, how do you see the cannabis and psychedelics markets evolving over the next three to five years? There's so many cannabis shops now. Have you noticed? Yeah. They're, they've sprung up everywhere. Yeah. It's going to be hard yeah. for one for them to all to make a lot of money. Yeah. I think that uh, cannabis ultimately, once it finishes its uh, trajectory of legalization in all jurisdictions, it will become like a Procter and Gamble, Johnson and Jod Johnson product. There will be nothing for any of these specialized cannabis companies, as far as I'm concerned, because ultimately they're selling a weed. It grows naturally. It's easy easy to grow and cultivate. In fact, I I grew one plant this year just because I threw it out back and it grew into this beautiful plant through no effort of my own. Yeah. All outdoor. Thing smells like it's got rank THC, like it is dank. And yeah. You, and, you, uh, did you cut her down? Yeah, I got it inside. I'm gonna I'm gonna give some to Ed. Okay. But uh, I don't think Hang there's it much upside of a business down. there. It's a commodity. Cannabis is just a commodity. Yeah. 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 At the end of the day, Nothing's psychedelics different ball game altogether. But I think it's gonna have there's gonna be a lot of trouble to monetize that. There's gonna be a handful of big players, Compass Pathways being one of them, and the rest there's gonna be 500 or more wannabes. They'll all disappear in time as the market catches on that there's no game here except a bunch of promoters lining their pockets. Uh, so that might sound a little pessimistic, but there you have it. If you like the show, you'll love our website. Visit us at www.midasletter.com for interviews with key CEOs, cannabis news, and to subscribe to our newsletter. Bruce Campbell joins us now from Stonecastle Asset Management for a, a cannabis industry update. Bruce Campbell is back. He's the portfolio manager of the Stone Castle Cannabis Growth Fund. Bruce, welcome back. Yeah, thanks for having me on again. It's always a pleasure, Bruce. Your insights are very appreciated. And Bruce, I've been seeing no end of breast beating and tearing out <laughs> of hair from U.S. cannabis investors as the U.S. cannabis sector seems to be struggling in equal measure to the Canadian cannabis sector. And in fact, all cannabis publicly traded companies worldwide seem to be sort of under the weather to say the least. What is the prognosis and what is the diagnosis? Yeah, I mean, when you look at it, obviously there's a big disconnect in my opinion and in our opinion in, um, in the US between the stock prices and the underlying businesses. And so, you know, ultimately that's when you talk about, you know, the prognosis and the diagnosis, that's ultimately what will win the day at the end of the day is, you know, once these businesses get recognized for what they are and some of the you know, external factors that have caused the stock prices to sell off the way they have disappear, then at that point in time, you know, the stock prices are going to do amazing things. But when is that? Is that, you know, two weeks from now, two months from now, two years from now? And obviously one of the challenges that we've seen in, in that market is really structurally around access to the stocks itself, who can hold it and who can trade them. And so, you know, kind of the latest uh, rumor that's been kind of circulating in the market is that JP Morgan is gonna pull back from custodying any, uh, any assets in the sector. And so, you know, that would obviously be another potential uh, blow. And if you saw some of the cannabis names in October, they were off, you know, 30% upwards. So, you know, maybe this was uh, just front running of, of that decision coming down. Yeah, you know, that's intriguing. I've seen some of the buzz about that. And it strikes me that is interesting because 
JP Morgan is not the most visible uh, house buying cannabis stocks over the last several years. So I, I don't really understand. I think that sort of negative is magnified out of proportion. Um, that's just my impression. But uh, it seems to me that people are more concerned with the passage of the Safe Banking Act. And is it actually going to become a thing? And is it going to get, you know, sort of, is it going to solve all the problems? And if you were to judge the sort of tone of the zeitgeist in social media, you might conclude that it's really not going to make that much of a difference. And that's possibly why investors are sort of pulling in their horns a bit. Yeah, I mean, that's probably the probably one of the bigger of of the uh, factors that are at play here. You know, if you go back, rewind the tape back to a year ago, everyone was quite excited. You know, election was happening. You know, Biden was uh, coming in and, you know, the thought that one of the first things he would work on was legalizing cannabis in some capacity or, um, you know, making it federally um you know, federally legal or, you know, not criminal in some capacity, decriminalizing it. Um, and that certainly hasn't been the case. I mean, it's fallen on a back burner. There's been multiple attempts to try to get, you know, Safe back Banking, States Act, you name it through the legislative uh, process, and it just really hasn't happened. Um, you know, the latest is that they were going to try to attach it to the stimulus bill, but, you know, it sounds like with the details and, and um, all the you know, political back and forth that that's not going to happen. And so, you know, most investors who are looking at that as a catalyst have now completely walked away. You throw on top of that, the, you know, the custodian issues between, you know, JP Morgan perhaps and, and some of the others that have walked away. And now you're probably seeing some tax loss selling because it's been a strong year in the capital markets beyond cannabis. And so, you know, there's people that are probably trying to offset their losses with their gain or their gains with their losses. And so you've probably seen some of that and it's, you know, turned out to be quite a rope for uh, cannabis investors for sure. Yeah, you bet. Um, so Bruce, you're, you're hosting the Stone Castle Indicator Update webinar on November the 9th. And I was curious as to what uh, what participants in that webinar might be able to learn. Yeah, so what we talk about there is, you know, we always talk about our top-down positioning and what specifically we do is try to figure out whether or not we're on offense in neutral or defense at any given time. So if we're on offense, obviously we're fully invested in defense where, you know, we typically have large cash positions, possibly some short positions or inverse positions. And what we'll walk through on that webinar is really what it is that you know, we see from a fundamental um, economic standpoint and then also from a market technical standpoint that has us positioned right now where we are. And we'll, you know, sort of walk through the fundamentals, walk through the technicals and then, you know, draw a conclusion at the end so that, you know, investors can take a look and figure out, you know, exactly how we think and what, what we see and then obviously make their own decisions from there. Yeah, you bet. Okay, so uh, what time on the 9th is that get started and how do, uh, how do investors log on? Yeah, so probably the easiest if they haven't registered and haven't got a link is to send an email to info at stonecastlefunds.ca and it starts on the 9th at 4.30 Eastern and it runs about half an hour. If um, if they happen to miss the live broadcast, we do a recording as well. So they can get the same, they can get the registration details for the, for the recording by sending an email to us as well. Sure. Okay, Bruce, let's switch gears a bit and talk about your uh, Stone Castle cannabis per portfolio. How have you been uh, sort of dealing with the continued weakness in the cannabis sector in your portfolio? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's been challenging. We've had, um, you know, we've had negative performance on the year now along with the sector. So uh, obviously that's never fun for investors. One of the things that we've been trying to do uh, where possible is we've been, you know, trying to high grade the portfolio. So, you know, if we have scenarios where, you know, it seems like everything's down, I don't think you can probably find anything that's direct cannabis um, that's up this year. So what we've tried to do is, you know, position the portfolio into companies that we think are attractive uh, and probably been punished more so than um, than some of their peers and have the potential to recover once the turn comes. And, you know, we've been investors in the sector since 2014. We've seen, 
you know, I think this is the seventh or eighth um, uptrend to downtrend now that we've seen. And typically when we see those, they're, you know, they're, the downtrends are 50% and the uptrends are, you know, 100% plus. So, you know, there's lots of opportunity. You just have to be nimble. And, you know, what we think is that we're obviously closer to the start here of the next uptrend than we are to uh, to the end of uh, or to the, to the start of the uh, downtrend. And so, you know, when we look at the opportunity set, it's to somebody who's patient and I mean that patience probably has us to go out, you know, say six months or so, but you know, it could start, you know, tomorrow it could start in three months time. It could start in the new year. We, we don't know when it will start, but just looking at the valuation and how attractive it is at some point and then the growth rate at some point in time, the sector is going to have a, a fairly big move again. Yeah. So, I mean, apart from the, uh, you know, the market weakness, which is one thing, the structural weaknesses that you refer to, um, the, the balance sheets and the earnings profiles of the best performing cannabis companies in the United States suggests that, you know, it really doesn't match the market weakness. So I'm curious as to why is there, why, why is the financial performance of these companies not having an effect on the negative performance in the stock market? Yeah. I mean, obviously, it, you know, we have seen tremendous improvements in their business. You know, a lot of the big MSOs are growing, you know, they're growing their uh, revenue line at, you know, sort of 25 to 50% and they're growing their EBITDA, at, you know, 50 to a hundred percent growth like that is, you know, unbelievable. And the thing is, is that, you know, that that's just probably in the, still the starting points for that. You know, it's not like they've had this big year for growth and then that's it. It'll be done. There's a lot of new states that are rolling out programs, um, especially in the recreational side of things, which, you know, it takes time to ramp up. And when it does, it can have, you know, significant numbers, but it takes those companies time to, you know, build their facilities, build their, um, their infrastructure. And then obviously the market takes a while to build as well, but that's what's coming. And, you know, when you look at, you know, kind of what we think is that, really it's some of these bigger structural issues that have had the impact. You know, if you're a U.S. investor, you probably still are shying away from cannabis for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, you might not be aware of the growth rates. One, um, two is, um, you know, you have uh, challenges obviously with, with the fact that it's still federally illegal and you don't want to mess with your uh, charter to, uh, to manage securities. And then, you know, obviously three is that, you know, the price momentum hasn't been there and there's so many other areas right now in the markets that have strong price momentum. So, you know, I think we, it's a combination of those factors, but, you know, at some point in time, it will go the other way. And from our perspective, the sentiment is getting very close to where it normally runs to be negative, where, you know, nobody wants to look at cannabis, the stocks themselves, you know, have a tough time having, you know, a positive day, let alone a positive week. And, um, you know, even the best quality companies are being sold off. So Bruce, it sounds to me like if, uh, if we were to look at the financial performance of these companies and were to look at the depth of the discount that has occurred as a result of the negative sentiment that, I mean, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but it would strike an uh, external investor that cannabis stocks are a bit of a screaming buy down here, which only begs the question, is now the time to start, you know, wading in and building a position if you've been on the sidelines, or do you think there's more pain to come and still a better price to be had? If, if we weren't investors in the sector right now, we'd probably take a, you know, probably two or possibly three pronged approach. So we would buy part of our position here and then add to that position when you started to see some of the price momentum improve because, you know, over the next uh, probably, you know, probably 45 days, we could see if we could potentially see uh, more selling on tax loss. Once that's done, I think at that point in time, you know, investors will start to look at it again. We're rolling up. We'll be at that point in time. We'll be rolling up to the end of the year. People will be looking for opportunities, and you know, they'll be harvesting some of their gains in other areas that have done really well, and looking for areas that haven't done so well. And if you just look at, you know, on aggregate, the U.S. MSOs, they've um, they've dropped from call it twenty times uh, 2022 EBITDA to now they're down around um, you know less than ten times, and there's some that are trading, you know, in the four, five, six range that you know are large MSOs that are growing at those multiples that we talked about earlier. Right. All right, Bruce. Well, great insight as usual. Really appreciate your time today. We'll come back to you soon. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. You bet. Bye for now.
today we are going to be talking about the price of copper. We're going to be talking about the price of gold. We're going to be talking about the price of Bitcoin, the price of Tesla. We're going to be talking about the price of tea in China. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about, I think we'll start off with this little tidbit of scintillating double speak Orwellian conversation. The Fed. The Fed. Yeah. So I'm going to put up a paragraph here and you tell me whether I'm smoking crack or I just really don't understand now, is this, English. Is this for public uh, dissemination or? I think we can safely discuss this publicly. Sent, sent to you by the Fed just for your eyes. <laughs> he said, let's send James a special note so he sounds like a complete moron. He, he won't get it. Exactly. And everybody will, you know, dismiss him yeah, further because yeah, uh, he's a complete I, moron. You know what? I, I don't know what the hell's going on in the Fed. So today, the New York Fed sent out a note, a statement, and the statement read, as you can see on the screen, that on November 3rd, 2021, which is Wednesday, the Federal Open Market Committee directed the open market trading desk of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to increase the system open market account holdings of Treasury securities by at least $70 billion per month and of agency mortgage-backed securities by at least $35 billion per month. That's 105. That's 105 during the monthly purchase period beginning mid-November. The FOMC also directed the desk to increase SOMA holdings of treasuries by $60 billion a month and uh, mortgage-backed securities, mortgage, agency mortgage-backed securities by an additional $30 billion a month, bringing us to $195 billion per Snick month. Stick under two. An additional stimulus on top of the existing $120 billion per month. So now that's, call it, round it up to $300 billion per month, which if you fractionally bank it out to $3 trillion, that's $3 trillion a month going into the stock market, mostly. And Stock so it's at an all time high today, James. Well, this the is the thing is on fire. But the next sentence after this first disclosure is completely Orwellian or I'm misreading something. The committee judges that some similar reductions in the pace of net asset purchases will likely be appropriate each month. That does not the addition of two hundred billion dollars constitute an, or? an, yeah, an increase, not a reduction. Well, it says right here, plain double speak. <laughs> Blaine Double Speak, exactly. The committee judges that similar reductions in the pace yeah. of net asset so, purchase. See? So it's now, right there for all. I, I don't even know what the fuck they're saying. No. No. And it's like, is this like, like, I don't know. Does if you, anybody out there is, are we reading something wrong here? Have we lost our shit? Please. Find this statement. It's on the it's on the website of the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States of America. No, the New York Fed. Well, the New York Fed, but the New York Fed is a subtab of the Federal Reserve Bank. Anyways, find this. Tell us what we're reading wrong here, right. please. Help us. Anyways, so now talking about, let's go look at some charts here. Charts. Nasdaq is at an all-time record high here. Yes. And. Now, before so is Tesla. all of you investment bankers and fund managers and wealth managers who think that you are, in fact, doing a good job of managing the, the money, take credit for some kind of skill set, which you may or may not have. I'm not saying you don't. But my point is that given that the Federal Reserve has now just doubled and then some the monthly fuel injection into the stock market, the stocks in the U.S. have no choice but to go up. This is nothing for Tesla. This is nothing for NASDAQ. There will be no correction anytime soon because the Fed just put any kibosh on that and get ready, buy the crap out of absolutely anything that trades on NASDAQ that you see in this list. Uh, buy anything that's like, and we don't own it because we're not participants in this. So we can't afford to be in it. Well, I mean, well, we could, we, but- You could buy a share of Tesla. Well, but you buy one share of Tesla, you're up 5X in a year. So that's better than a lot of things, but we have to deal, unfortunately, Ed and I- With the real world. Yeah, we have to deal with the real world. And so we're looking- Our, our real world. We're stupid. We're basically looking for companies that are undervalued, have something really of quality to offer the world. And so, Yes, these companies may or may remember, not go remember up. Remember the band Credence Clearwater Revival? Vaguely. Yeah, well, we're Cretans Clearwater Revival. Cretans. 
<laughs> Cretton, speak for yourself, Edward. I'm feeling well, I'm a just, youthful 58. Just, you know, foisting a little bit of Didn't you humility. just have a birthday? Uh, You're 32 again, aren't you? Am I rickety? Yeah, <laughs> rickety. Rickety Polsky O'Gorky. Rickety. Ooh, we could make a limerick out of that. Oh. Oh, a little limerick. Oh. Oh. No. Anyways, I want to point out before we launch this next interview that uh, we are having discussions with Zortex about engaging us yeah, we as the their as their capital markets communicators. And so we don't at this point have any conflict of interest, but we might. So I just want to say that if we're sounding right. a little bit bullish on Zortex, here's proof that we are actually aligning our interest with your interest because we're effectively making the price of our option cost more by talking about it before we're even engaged. Yes. So so there you have it. And But we are pursuing them because well, and we've had them on the show for years. If you search Zortex and Midas Letter, you'll yes. find two other interviews at least, if not three. Over the last three years, probably. Yeah, so it just became a Class A opportunity from a speculator's perspective, which is why we're pursuing it. So without further ado, please allow, welcome, Dr. Alan Davidoff. Dr. Alan Davidoff, CEO of Zortex Therapeutics Inc., now trading on NASDAQ under the symbol XRTX, joins us again. Dr. Davidoff, welcome back. Thank you, James. Thank you to uh, your folks at Midas Letter. Really looking forward to the chat today, and, and it's a pleasure to provide an update. You bet. So um, it has been, Alan, about a year since we last had you on the show, and there's been some real changes in the whole Zortex thing. You're now trading on NASDAQ. You found that you've got some relevance to the COVID-19 pandemic. So why don't we start, give me an overview of the developments in the company over the last year, please. Yeah, you bet. Well, I think last time we spoke, we were, we were in a non-deal roadshow scenario and moving forward. Uh, with the proposal that we'd raise some additional funds, that we'd move forward, start drug manufacturing, and and really start to get the ball rolling in terms of the basic uh, steps that we needed to take to get to phase three clinical trials. Uh, since the time that we last talked, we have raised that money. We have almost completed the GMP manufacturing of drugs. So that's clinical quality, clinical ready drug for moving ahead. We're preparing regulatory filings. And in the interim, since we've chatted, we wrote some provisional patents around the COVID space. We recognized very early that acute kidney injury may be uh, involving, involved with high uric acid levels, and that may be contributing to not only acute kidney injury, but acute multi-organ injury and possibly even sepsis in that space. Uh, we entered into a partnership with the Mount Sinai Health Network in Network, Network in New York, and uh, the results that are emerging from their work are clear indications that uric acid is involved, that it increases the odds ratio for injury much higher, and we know those acute injuries are closely correlated to mortality. Um, we've also initiated basic work in, in also our polycystic kidney disease program. As, as you mentioned, we've also completed an uplisting along with uh, fundraising associated with that to, for the NASDAQ uh, US securities uplisting. So a lot of things have happened in the last year. And, and you know the real bonus from that is uh, we've also been able to strengthen our management team our board of directors and our clinical advisory board over the course of the last year. So we're well poised to move, move ahead uh, in the next 15 months or so. Sure. So one of the most interesting characteristics of Zortex at this point from an investor's perspective is uh, you've consolidated the stock in such a way to, to achieve your NASDAQ listing, understandable, but it's now a company that's got such a small number of shares out. What's the total number of shares outstanding currently? Uh, 12 million in the float and 18 million all in. Right, so 18 million shares all out for a, a company that is very advanced in its, uh, its evolution of its products. Um, to me, that represents an extraordinary opportunity for investors who are so inclined. Um, and I say that not as an investor at this point, though I do expect to become uh, a shareholder relatively soon here. Um, so that's that's intriguing to me. 
And uh, so in that, you're now traded on NASDAQ. What, uh, what sort of coverage have you got in terms of bringing this story to the institutional and the retail investor realm in the biotech investor space in the United States? Well, great question. You know, I think the, 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 the founding principle here is that uh, NASDAQ uplisting, listing on U.S. securities exchanges is, is always a boost to your liquidity, boost to your access to public markets, um, certainly exposure. And as you mentioned, and as, as we're very aware of, these late stage clinical trials are often accompanied by partnerships. They're often accompanied by progress that is increasingly de-risked. So as, as we move forward, we are working very diligently on uh, non-deal roadshow visits right now, uh, outreach, and, and most recently this morning, uh, we had a very nice report come out from eResearch uh, on, on Zortex Therapeutics. There are two other analysts writing reports that we expect to see before Christmas time on Zortex, on our late stage clinical trials, both in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, which is an orphan indication that's, that's largely undertreated, but also in acute kidney injury and secondarily acute uh, organ injury, multi-organ injury in hospitalized COVID patients. So a bright year ahead as far as recognition and analyst coverage and the kinds of roadshow work that we're doing to expose the story, not only to the US, but European markets as well. Sure. Could you elaborate a bit on the treatment of COVID related injury, organ injury, uh, and how that came about and how your compounds work to treat that? We had um, a reasonable basic understanding that acute kidney injury could involve high uric acid levels. Um, we didn't know the breadth of what was happening in patients with COVID. And as, as the Mount Sinai programs have advanced, uh, this week later on, we published uh, a, a news release showing some of the data that's been released online uh, that implicates uric acid in the acute injury that's happening in kidneys, uh, certainly in the heart. And we believe that there is a, a new indication that's been unmasked uh, with respect to sepsis, where uric acid seems to be driving the kind of sepsis that can lead to a procoagulative state. So the, th the thrombus, the myocardial infarction, kidney infarction, brain, et cetera, stroke um, that's happening with COVID patients. So that indicates that there's an opportunity for patients who are hospitalized to show up with this uh, combination of acute kidney injury, any evidence of acute kidney injury, plus high uric acid in the range where we know we have the tools to treat it. The, the approach is to lower it very rapidly and then maintain it for about a 30 day period and then follow up those patients in clinical trials. We believe that this approach will remove that layer of injury that's happening associated with COVID, but, but specifically due to uric acid levels. So we think we're ideally positioned not only to conduct a, a clinical trial that we're slating as six to seven months to complete, but also to be in a position for emergency use approval uh, after that tr clinical trial is completed. Mm -hmm. So it's a registration trial. Sure. Do you have a sense of what percentage of COVID hospitalizations uh, are uh, suffer a, a injury because of uric acid levels? Yeah, there's some really good fundamental work that's been done. We see that about 50% of individuals who are hospitalized have levels of acute kidney injury where we think they're addressable. What we see at the time of discharge, and there are some very nice papers from this, this work, this working group at the at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital Network in New York, showing about 35% of individuals leave hospital with acute kidney injury. Even after 90 days, their acute kidney injury isn't greatly improved. And what that suggests and, and agrees with uh, other work from, from British, British researchers is that there seems to be an emerging chronic kidney disease that's, an, that's novel and an accelerated form, which very likely could be the second leading cause of 
chronic kidney disease in the future. So we think we can address that, decrease the severity of individuals while they're hospitalized, and that bodes well for quality of life and uh, potentially reducing that chronic kidney injury burden that is that is coming. Mm -hmm. Is there any existent uh, emergency use authorizations for any competing sort of treatment for this condition? Right. Well, what we've seen is is there are three or four drug or therapeutic approaches that work. Obviously, vaccines help people. They protect people over time. And, and um, you know, we encourage everyone to get their vaccines. We have seen very compelling data from a drug called dexamethasone, which is an anti-inflammatory drug. It's received emergency use pr approval. We know that uh, molnuvapir nuv from Merck is poised for treatment again, it's an antiviral, so it's meant to decrease the amount of viral load that individuals see. That looks like for some individuals, a portion of the population who have kidney disease or who have COVID may benefit from it. Those are the obvious ones. Uh, beyond that, uh, we don't see much on the horizon that would be beneficial, although we, we are monitoring on a regular basis. So we think we're ideally suited to address this unique mechanism of injury that's occurring with COVID due to high uric acid levels. Sure. And so uh, I guess in that there's a sort of an urgency to the COVID-19 related conditions, especially um, that this has sort of caused uh, a bit more attention, a, a bit more compressed timeline in terms of the FDA's willingness to sort of advance your studies? Right. I think, I think if you have a compelling rationale for a clinical study, the, the road is more permissive to move forward quickly. I think in terms of a viral uh, infection, the treatment period is naturally... Uh, during the course of that active infection. And, and so for us, the, the rationale is a 30-day approach. Um, if that can help people and improve their quality of life, uh, you know, we see the opportunity for emergency use approval as, as an opportunity to be marketing a drug in a year's time or so. Mm -hmm. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, by the end of 22. Sure. Okay, so then... Um your partnership, you, you, you announced the outcome of the study of Mount Sinai back uh, earlier in October. Um, do you have other partnerships, uh, research relationships in the space expected to come to market in 2022? Not, in, not to market in 2022. Our lead program is in polycystic kidney disease, where we see uh, an opportunity to do a bridging pharmacokinetic study that would then lead into a phase three registration trial. That's a registration trial that would look to decrease the rate at which filtering capacity declines in patients with uh, moderate to severe polycystic kidney disease and would provide um, an opportunity to perhaps improve quality of life. We think that there are signs within the data that suggests for every year of treatment, we can keep people off of dialysis or off of um, tr the need for transplantation. So that, that from a socioeconomic standpoint is, is a very important milestone for a lot of patients who don't have therapeutic options. There is a single drug approved in the autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease space Tolvaptin or Genarc. It's in year three of approval of a, of a seven-year exclusivity because it's an orphan uh, area. That drug is serving about 5% of the market. So we see our drug as being novelly and ideally situated to be first in class to deal with this mechanism of injury that's happening in polycystic kidney disease. We think that that approval probably is 2025. Interesting. All right, Alan, we're going to leave it there for now. I really appreciate your time for the update. We'll come back to you soon and see what's happening. Thanks for your time today. All right, take care, James. Bye-bye. So basically, this is the new reality of Zortex, and it is trading clearly in the range of 370. Uh, has traded as US. high as... 
U.S. has traded as high as six dollars. And the funding was done around four seventeen. Let's not forget that. And the funding was done at four seventeen, and the volume today is uh, twenty-seven. Yeah, twenty-seven point one five million shares traded today. The average volume over the last 10 days has been 5.52 million, but though that, vol that average volume is up in the last three days because since we published our first story with Al in there. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, yesterday and today it's traded 53 million shares, yeah. roughly four times yeah. the float. Four so times the... You want to know why the stock is driving like this? It's because it's, I bet you, almost exclusively due to the fact that he's, as he points out, 50% of COVID-19 hospitalizations resolve, result in individuals having extreme kidney damage as a result of too much uric acid production. And this is the solution that diminishes uric acid production and therefore will give 50% of hospitalized COVID-19 patients a better outcome. That is the premise. That is what is driving the enthusiasm. Their, and they have other trials. And they have other shit going on as well. <laughs> so. Phase three, going into phase three. <coughs> yeah, anyway, phase three. let's not blow our horn too much here. Yeah, so anyways, yes, we might be uh, talking a lot about Zortex soon, but if not, this is a stock that yeah. both Ed and I feel you couldn't hurt yourself on too badly. And we say that having and, no and, conflict. And, and uh, Obviously, lots of up upside. Yeah, potentially lots of. Upside. All right, so moving right along, let's talk about Graphene yeah, Manufacturing this Group. This is another stock that's been on fire lately. This one, I am conflicted in, in that I bought. Uh, yeah, you've been four hundred and seventy. Wow. No, what did I buy? I had four hundred and seventy thousand shares that I bought at an average of twenty-five cents. I've still got fifty-two thousand shares left. I have been selling throughout this phase, so I've made a lot of money with this company. Now I'm doing everything in my power to not sell that last block of 52,000 shares because I get the sense that this thing could go triple digits. Especially if you, I don't know if anybody out there, did you see the article in Forbes today? Go look up Forbes auto section. There's an article about graphene manufacturing groups, yeah. uh, aluminum graphene ion battery, and the fact that it's got this incredible energy density improvement over lithium ion, and it removes all risk of fire. So, Graphene Manufacturing wow. Group, conflicted. I own the stock. I make, I've made a ton of money on it. All, All right. right, so that's Graphene Group. Now, I want to talk a bit about our sponsors. We have two sponsors, yeah. which means we're super conflicted. Uh, the first one is uh, Voxter Analytics. Voxter is yeah. real estate at the speed of light. Um, Trades a lot of volume every day. Now, this is the last time it did this move here. This was the last time they came out with their quarterly financials. And this is what it does after the financials because it's got 400 million shares out. Be sure. Because it's got 400 million shares out, it attracts the incentive trade for just order flow from all of the platforms, which gives it the sense that it's going nowhere with a lot of volume. And that's one of the downsides structurally about the uh, entire publicly traded market system is did you know, did you know that the operators of all the trading platforms are offering incentives to different brokerage firms to divert their order flow to their platform in exchange for half a penny a trade, quarter penny a trade, three quarters of a penny per trade, penny and a half per penny trade, here, penny whether here. it's in, whether it's out. Yeah, so anyways, the markets are uh, skewed against the performance possibilities of the retail investor for reasons that we're not going to talk about any further here because I see a little yeah. red dot on your forehead, Ed. Is that a little red dot? Is there a drone in here? Wow. Yeah, bang, you're dead. Anyway, so uh, Voxter, Voxter Analytics, 400 million plus shares outstanding. We're gonna have the CEO of their most recent acquisition, uh, Real Wealth Networks. They just acquired Real Wealth Networks. The CEO of that company is gonna be joining us for an interview soon. They've made four acquisitions, three of which have closed. Uh, the only one outstanding, I believe, is Benutech. Um, but the biggest competitor they have is DOMA, trades on NASDAQ, or NYSE, symbol D-O-M-A. And for my money, Voxter's the better mousetrap. I invite anybody out there to compare the two and see what you think. Um, Voxter is going to be reporting uh, financials again, I believe, on November 30th. And so, good time to buy this stock, in my opinion. Conflicted and biased. Uh, our other sponsor now, this company excites me to no end, New Ran Wireless. 
You know about New Ran, Edward? Yeah, they're doing uh, they're doing a, a bunch of work in Africa, aren't they? They are. And so now this is another restructuring story. So New Ran consolidated the stock 15 for one, so that now they have a grand total of uh, 30 million shares outstanding. Right. The manageable uh, a number. Oh, of it's a minuscule number of shares outstanding, and uh, they they raised 11 million bucks. They have just achieved a uh, bank lending facility from a local bank in Cameroon to build over 100 wireless sites. Now these guys specialize in bringing wireless communications to remote rural sites where they don't have any wireless in a lot of cases, or they have crappy wireless in other cases. But they're doing this in uh, Cameroon, they're doing this in DRC, the Congo, and uh, the great thing about it is they're financing these with bank financing, which means they don't have to dilute in the market. At least that's the theory that we're working upon and we're sticking to that story. So, New Rand Wireless, a company that has, again, the narrative has changed due to the stock consolidation, but they're also achieving milestones. So here's the press release that most New Rand most recently came out with where they announced the th $3 million bank loan from the local Cameroon bank for up to 122 sites in the Cameroon. They're going to fund up to 75% of those sites uh, out of uh, borrowed money at 9% which is good for equity investors. Anyways, it's time for another guest. Adam Wilkes joins us now. He is the CEO of Tyson 2.0, which is, you guessed it, Mike Tyson's next cannabis deal. Here's Adam. Adam Wilkes joins me now. He's the CEO of Tyson 2.0. Uh, Adam, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Adam, that's, uh, it's an intriguing name. I'm assuming that the, uh, the great Mike T Tyson is involved with the company. Absolutely. Um, uh, passion, passion for the plant. And, and yes, Mike's are uh, the face, the name, and, and the brains behind the, the whole concept of Tyson 2.0. Fantastic. Yeah, he's been uh, he's been quite the advocate for cannabis pretty much from the get go. So tell us about Can Tyson 2.0. What is the business model? Where are the markets? So uh, Tyson 2.0, we just announced uh, last week, uh, we're rolling out across the entire nation. One of the first cannabis brands in history to uh, come out the door with 16 plus states um, as far as a, a launch. Um, and yeah, we're rolling out high quality products across the nation at different price points to cater to all different types of demographics. So everybody has the opportunity to be a part of the Tyson um tribe is what we call it, um, but part of the Tyson crew and the ability to smoke what Mike Tyson approves himself. So all of our products are Tyson approved. Um, I'll go through R&D with Mike Tyson himself. Um, and, and again, we, we end up choosing the products that best um, suit Mike's needs, wants, and, and um, the medical benefits of uh, Sure. So Mike had a, uh, a growing operation called Tyson Farms a while back. Is that part of this? So, no, that was Tyson Ranch. Tyson Ranch is no longer a, a live entity that was shut, uh, closed up. Tyson 2.0 um, is his new um, and improved um, brand new entity cannabis line um, where, where, again, Mike is behind it. Mike supports it. And again, it's, it's we're producing the products that Mike uses himself and bringing it to the customers uh, nationwide. Sure. But Tyson, yeah, Tyson 2.0 is uh, Mike's cannabis company and cannabis line. Wow, very cool. Um, okay, so then in terms of uh, distribution, whereabouts are your products going to be available? So we're launching, uh, this year we'll be launched in California, Nevada, and Colorado as our first three markets. Um, we've executed a licensing agreement to launch in 16 plus states, um, but those will be our first three. Um, Q1 of next year, we'll be uh, releasing the fall, the next three and quarterly by uh, uh, three following each quarter, um, which gives us the time to to really um, roll out properly in each state and and bring Mike out to to experience each market and again give the customers a chance to experience the product and and again get face to face with Mike as as we roll out across the nation. Sure. So he's acting as the brand ambassador, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh huh. And uh, have you found so far that his name is still a draw for cannabis products specifically? 
Absolutely. I've worked with several celebrities, athletes, um, uh, artists in the past. Um, I've been in the licensing and royalty space for over 15 years. Um, and I've never worked with anybody or any brand that's been as authentic as Mike Tyson and Tyson 2.0. Um, it's as organic as it gets. He's, he's, he's uh, the real deal. Again, he smokes daily and uses it for his mental health. Um, and again, we're here to bring the same products that he's using to, again, the, the nationwide all the, all, all, uh, and internationally. Eventually, we are working on some deals in Canada as well. Um, but yes, nationwide to start and, again, bring products to everybody to help with, you know, as, as you're aware, there's a massive um, issue in this country with, with mental, mental health and, and the opioid um, pandemic. And again, cannabis is, in my opinion, a miracle drug. I've been a fan and using it for over 20 years myself um, and why me and Mike connected so well. You know, the connection we had and, and both of us having such a passion for the plant and plant-based medicine. Um, so yeah, no, I'm just overall just excited to be a part of it and, and sure. excited to bring uh, you know, Tyson 2.0 to customers nationwide. Sure. The uh, U.S. cannabis sector has been uh, under pressure in the publicly traded realm, largely because the Safe Banking Act is sort of slow in its evolution through the system and the absence of, you know, overt support from the Biden-Harris administration that seemed to be like a slam dunk at when they first took office. Um, to what extent is the success of Tyson 2.0 dependent on the passage of the Safe Banking Act? Um, we're not we're not uh, relying on the Safe Banking Act to pass. Yes, it will pass. It's it's a, it's a when, not an if. Um, but we're we're chugging full force forward, um, and, and we'll again be continuing our rollout plan in all 16 plus states. Um, and, and again, bringing this product to patients and customers nationwide with or without the Safe Banking Act passing. Um, but yes, once it does pass out, it'll do wonders for the industry, wonders for all brands, all companies and everybody as a whole. Um, but again, we will be continuing and moving forward with or without it. And, and it doesn't it doesn't. Yes, it will affect the industry as a whole. It doesn't play a huge part in our rollout plan. Sure. Um, Okay, so then uh, what is the, is there any sort of product in the Tyson line that is sort of like way above everything else, the flagship product, or is it basically the whole product line is the flagship? So the whole, I would say the whole product line is the flagship, but we do have some key products like the Toad line that Mike has, again, s smoked himself and a huge fan of himself. Um, as we go through the R&D process, Mike will choose, you know, we'll bring him 15 strains. He'll pick his top two or three strains um, from our cultivation facilities. Um, and those will be the products we run with. Now, um, we'll use those same strains for the entire product line. So we are rolling out, you know, a full flower line and pre-rolls. So that's Mike's number one product that he prefers to consume with. Um, we'll also be rolling out some edibles for people that don't want to be smoking um, uh, joints or, or flower product. Uh, we'll also have uh, live rosins, concentrates, and vapes, uh, uh, again, to try and cater to all different um, consumers. Um, everybody consumes our cannabis products in, in a different way, so we'll ensure that um, we have products to provide to everybody um, in all different categories and price points. Sure. Do you see the, uh, you know, the ongoing legalization of cannabis across all states sort of a fait accompli at this point, it's just a matter of time till they're all there. And at what point can we expect to see federal deprohibition? So it's definitely like you just said, it's, it's, it's when, not an if, um, when all these states do come online. Um, we're excited and got our hands full executing 16 states as is and, and think that that's a great, um, we'll, we'll be making a huge impact on this country as far as bringing high quality products at the right price. Um, through the Tyson 2.0 line. Um, yeah, again, and, and when it does go federally legal, I think that's gonna, it's a huge plus for all of us, for everybody in the, in the industry. I mean, there's a lot of people like, uh, like myself that have been in this space for eight plus years and, and just um, excited to see the, the progress and moving along in, in Washington. So again, we can do what we love to do <clears throat> uh, 
on a little more of a legal front. I mean, this is as legal as it gets, but once the feds open it up, we'll be able to cross state lines. We'll be able to sell, you know, interstate, um, the interstate commerce will all open up and we'll have the ability to, again, I think it'll just scale the, the operations, um, exponentially. Sure. And how does the relationship with Columbia care work? So Columbia Cares our nationwide um, uh, cultivation partner. So we've partnered with them in, again, uh, starting with 10 states, but totally they have 16 states they, they cover. Um, we'll be rolling out in all of their states, starting with Colorado as the first, their first, um, the first rollout uh, end of month. Um, and again, they're cultivating all of our products. We'll be working with them strain specific gen and genetics and, um, Mike will be, again, lots of marketing materials coming out with Mike's involvement and promos to um, invite the Tyson following and Tyson patients and Tyson customers, Tyson 2.0, again, just overall fans to connect with Mike in many different ways in all different markets across this country. Um, as we roll this out, we're going to be bringing, bringing Mike on tour and, again, giving people a chance to connect with Mike. Um, as, as again, Tyson 2.0 rolls out across the nation. Sure, you bet. Okay, so then in 2022, for investors, what are the big sort of headlines we should look for that will be indicative of growing value for shareholders? So obviously increased um, penetration across the nation as we roll out more and more states, increased revenue. Um, since we're a licensing and royalty model, um, we're very asset light. Um, we run lean, my background's a food space. And as everybody knows, you know, we've operated 82 fast food brands in 42 countries, um, in the food space, if you're not lean, you're not, you're not going to survive. So, uh, we, we operate extremely lean, profitable, and, um, our main focus is, uh, it, it continued expansion and again, penetrate as much of this country as possible and continue the growth into Canada and, um, other international opportunities. You bet. All right, Adam, we're going to leave it there for now. That's a great introduction. I'll look forward to having you back and hopefully Mike at some point too. Love to hear his thoughts on how professional sports could benefit from the legalization and use of cannabis. Uh, but we'll leave that for a future conversation. Thanks for your time today. Great. Thank you. Have a great day. You bet. Bye for now. When the Fed, Fed came out and talked all this, this talk about, you know, we're going to start tapering to increase 15 a billion a month interestingly enough the 10-year rate dropped today dropped you would have thought it would have went up with all that you know hawkish diatribe but maybe it's not so hawkish well yeah. so so yeah. that's just it if they're creating the wealth effect then are they saying to the banks they're saying banks look don't worry about the money you're going to lose lending because you're going to make it up by moving it over into your active trading accounts and yeah. buying tesla because we're flooding the market with money and Tesla has nowhere to go but up on that impetus. It's like if you have a bathtub full of rubber ducks and the bathtub's, you know, half full of water and you add another quarter tub of water, the ducks can only rise. They can't sink. The only way oh, for so this- Is that why ducks float along the water? You didn't know? It's due to stimulus. They're rubber. They're, no, it's because of quantitative easing. Quack, 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 quack. Well, the point I was trying to make was when it comes to Fed matters, I don't usually talk about it because I don't think anybody really knows what's oh, going on. It's all speculation, Edward. Jesus. Our, our conversation is all speculation. We're, we're trying to discern the patterns. Yeah. So what else? What else? Um, Tesla, all time high. Well, it's all tied into the printing of money. Yeah, exactly. Tesla can only go higher as long as they're printing capital. Look at this. NASDAQ 100 is the orange line, yeah. and this is Tesla. So Tesla is outperforming oh, yeah. the NASDAQ, uh, yeah. but it's very closely correlated to the NASDAQ. Well, it's not that closely correlated. It, it is. I mean, it's leading the NASDAQ, if you want. Well, that's just, you know, depending on where you put your yeah. line, it is closely correlated to the NASDAQ. Trillion one now or something like that? Well, if you look at this, every time there's a step up, like the, the correlation is quite close in the most recent history. If you go way back sure, here, the correlation sure. is less. Okay. Now, but, suffice to say, you know, I, I haven't looked at, like the NASDAQ's all-time high, S&P's all-time high, Dow Jones, you know, 
the, the, whatever the Fed said to make us go, ooh. Let's talk about copper, Ed. Uh, Copper's, I think, around 471, uh, sorry, 431, 432. Yeah. There's a big trend line mm -hmm. there that, you know, if you look at the here, let's top do this. here, top here, top here, draw that line. It, it just ties right in with that bottom right we're forming Oops. right now. So, so if you look at that, you'll say we broke through it to the upside. Now we're coming down to test it. So it used to be the line of, of resistance. Now it should be the line of support. So I'm hopeful. And it does look like it's starting to flatten out a bit, but it's been a pretty rough ride. We were here a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, talking about 475 copper, and here it is 431. But it's 431. It's not 331. Yeah. And, and where's the world going? More electric, more electric, more electric. Right. So, you know, for U.S. copper shareholders, U.S. copper, uh -huh. ouch. Yeah. Well, so, okay, so the, the idea is we're electrifying the uh, fossil fuel fleet of the world. That's generators, that's pumps that run big water, gen you know. hydroelectric power generation, water supply systems. Trucking, shipping. Well, they're coming out with a, a General Motors is coming out with a truck that's electric that looks like a 1957 Chevy pickup. Really? Yeah, there, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on, but it's all electric. Yeah. No, and, there's and, there's no end of electric. And look at Tesla. Maybe the, the. Well, thanks to Tesla, they're all able to raise capital because everybody wants to make a bet that this could be the next Tesla. Did you see what happened to Avis Group this week? No. Avis came out with better than expected earnings. Hey, look at this. Wow. That stock, that apparently, this, 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 look where it got to. Way up here, like 500 some bucks. From 539. Down. Yeah, they, they say this is your classic short squeeze. This thing got so squeezed, but, but it's come, you know. But I mean, that's, that's a short cover. Well, the, yeah, the squeeze was on, and squeeze makes the price rise. Right. Right? You got a cover, and so, the, the world we live in. I mean, it's mind-boggling. Yeah. So, basically, this is the value trend, although this has now changed. Well, now that now the stock is way up. So, way, what was there fundamentally to make the stock have this revaluation? Re it came out with a, uh, a, a pretty good quarter. That's our show for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Do write us, send us a letter. We'll do our best to answer. Join us again, won't you? And we'll have more stocks going 10 bagger before you can say jack the motherfucking bear next week. Bye for now. <laughs>